Good morning. Please stand with us as we begin our worship together. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons, through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Thank you. 
Would you pray with me, please? Father, we come into your presence this morning as a needy people. We come with people whose hearts are aching and broken. We come as people whose hearts are rejoicing. We come together with one purpose, however, and that is to worship and to honor your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege of being able to do that in a corporate sense. And we rejoice in knowing that our next breath is ordained by you, and you know every issue of our hearts. So we come into your presence with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We are thankful to you, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now while we're standing, would you please greet one another? And it's my joy to welcome those of you who are joining us by radio this morning. Thank you for being a part of our service from Caldwell First Baptist Church. This morning, we're continuing our study in the life and ministry of John the Baptist, and we'll begin in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, so I invite you to have your Bible open to that text. We're so glad you joined us. God bless you as we worship the Lord together. You may be seated. As you're being seated, let me uh, just give a particular welcome to everyone who's here this morning and uh, I want you to know that in a corporate sense, we're so glad you're here, but we're also thankful individually for every one of you who's here this morning and uh, for you making this a priority to be here to worship the Lord together this morning. And uh, there, there are benefits of sharing in worship together that we don't gain when we listen to the radio or when we watch television or uh, sit on the sidelines, so I'm so glad that you're here today. Our missionaries of the week today both serve Wycliffe Bible translators. And the first is Carol Brenton. Carol, of course, is one of our own. She's actually here this morning. Carol, it's good to have you here. And, uh, and yet, uh, also, to stay in personal touch, um, I have a recent prayer letter from Carol, an envelope that's addressed to her for you to write a note of encouragement to her. It's got a stamp on it. Just lift your hand. We'll get this to you, and you can write Carol a note. Um, there we are. Thank you. And our other missionaries of the week are also, as I said, with Wycliffe Bible Translators, Mike and Thera Anderson. Mike and Thera uh, spend a good part of their time in Dallas, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and then travel to Sudest, the island of Sudest off the coast of New Guinea, where they're finalizing the translation of the scriptures in the Sudes language. They've given their lifetime to this work. And uh, now they face another challenge. Mike has prostate cancer. He's taking treatment for that. But the work on the translation continues. I have a recent prayer letter from them and uh, an envelope that's stamped an address for you to write a note to them just to let them know we're praying for them. And here's a hand right here in the center aisle. Thank you very much. Well, one of our outreach ministries that we're committed to is the ministry of Warm Lake Camp. And, uh, you know, when I think about our present facility at Warm Lake, I remember all the way back to the tent days when I was a child and we did camp at Warm Lake. Come on up. Um, 
And, uh, and, and now here we are, more than 50 years later, still doing camp at Worm Lake. And we're looking forward to the season this year. Jack is our um, groundsman, and Angeline helps with programming. And so they're going to give us an update on where we are with camp ministry for 2013 at Worm Lake. Good morning. It's a fun time to look forward to the beginning of camp as I just look at this row here of, of kids on the front that have all been a part of camp, and I thank the Lord for that. Um, and if you maybe noticed in your directory, your new directory, there's a wonderful page of camp pictures and uh, a blessing of that. This year, our, our theme at, at camp for our youth camps is being divided amongst God's love letter, his word, and his creation. And the verse that is going to be our theme verse is John 1, 4, and this is from the New Living Bible. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. Our, our two um, junior camps will be... Uh, studying the Bible's, well, our own account, our only account of creation, and that will be um, in those two camps. What I want to, to share with you is just real quickly the dates for our camps. The first one that is very important to Jack and I is the getting of camp open, and that uh, work camp is May 31st. It's the weekend after the Memorial Day weekend, May 31st through June 2nd. We will be there a few days before that. If there is time that you could come and help us then, and maybe not later, we will be there at other times also. Please let the office or us know if you will be coming. The meals are provided Friday, Saturday, and through noon on Sunday. Our high school camp is the end of June, June 30 to July 6th. That is grades 10 through 12. Junior high is July 7 through 13, and that's grades 7 through 9. And those are the grades that you will be entering in the fall. Junior boys, July 14 through 20, grades 4 through 6. And junior girls, July 21 through 27, and that's same ages. We have a college career camp, July um, 27 through 30. Um, I know that that's the same date that the girls camp ends, but yes, they start that evening, the college career. Our family camp is August 15 through 18, and then the men's camp this year is at the end of our camp season. What a smart thing to do to help them put things away. <laughs> so that's August 31 through September 2nd, and that is Labor Day weekend, but we're finished on Sunday. We're not, and maybe you won't be, but that's, you can go home and spend that time of the Labor Day weekend. Again, uh, for those who want to serve on the staff, there is a training that's required if you did not have it last year. And so the first Saturday of April, training here from 10 till about noon, and then the first Saturday of May is another training. And so that's where you're application and your forms will be given to you for getting recommendations and so forth. Um, this morning we will be start beginning our camp booth right out in the foyer. Um, the big Warm Lake Camp sign is hanging right below um, on that booth. And Nikki Beers is going to be um, the representative for camp. I will be there some, but um, Nikki will be in charge of making sure those registrations get turned in and um, was just told this morning that um, God has given us a new registrar, and that's Richard Bishop, and he will be doing this this year. Yes. I believe that I have been a threat to him <laughs> for a few weeks, and it's hard for him to even face me, because he and I are just good friends, but this morning he came and faced me and told me that. So praise the Lord. Doyle Runyon has done a wonderful job. Doyle's job is going to be taking him um, out of the area and a, a different schedule and everything, and he didn't feel he could keep that up. But he should know 
that he will be training, he will be working with Richard for this year. <laughs> Jack is going to share some of our projects and proposals that we have for this year, and then I will be back up to um, share a little bit about our auction and donation supper that is coming. As she's been talking, uh, you probably noticed that uh, thanks to Shane up there in the booth, he's been putting some camp photos up on the screen here for us. And that always helps to uh, get an idea of what camp looks like. And it's not always like that when we've had some major fires up there, but uh, it's coming back. And I would like personally to thank everybody that has had a share in camp over the years, either working there, praying for us, or financially, because without those three things, we would not be a camp. And uh, we've had a lot of challenges over the years, and we have two of them this year. Seems like the Forest Service always has to make, remake their rules, even though they uh, give us certain rules, and then they go and change them. Uh, I think, the P, like Dick said, the people in Boise have to continue to have something to do, so they continue to change the rules. And uh, with that, with the fireside rebuilding since the falling of the major tree there took it all out. We submitted plans to do that. The gentleman in, Boy or in Cascade was very uh, approval of them. He said I'd have put a stamp on it right now if I could, but I got to send it through Boise. And uh, they made some changes on them. Uh, we are still waiting for uh, the approval of our little building that we'd like to bring up for an office. Uh, we did submit everything that they requested, but we haven't heard anything. So pray that the Lord will open that up for us, so that we'll be able to get that taken care of. Uh, just some of the... I have to put these on to read with. I can see you all right without them. I guess that's age. Uh, we just have a few things. We're, we're looking at trying... We're not looking. We're trying to get a door to replace the one on the... Uh, cafeteria because it's had too many snow bangs against it and it's probably older than most of us so uh, and then uh, we are looking for a ceiling fan to replace one in the chapel that uh, makes more noise than what the preacher does and so we need to get it out of there uh, we have some uh, work to do in, in the boys' cabins. We've had requests that we enclose between two bunks and make a kind of a closet out of it. And so that will be one of the projects. And we still have a lot of cleanup to do from uh, the last couple of years that we've had trees down. And especially out around uh, the uh, confidence course area and just all around camp. And all, all during winter, you know, we have a lot of snow up there and stuff and wind, and so we have a lot of broken limbs. And we still have to replace the faucet and the bathroom kitchen. We have to do, already have that. We just need it replaced. And just general maintenance of all the buildings, you know, after they've set all winter, they have to be cleaned and uh, brought up to par. And we thank you for Hiram's brother, Norm. We were able to get four hot water heaters for our bathrooms, for the price, it would probably charge, cost us for one at Grover's or V1. So that was real a blessing. We thank uh, Hiram for helping in that. And uh, we're hoping uh, that uh, we can get those partially installed before work camp. Uh, kind of like a couple of the junior high and high school kids, especially the high school, they said, you know, it's nice to have enough water to take a shower instead of being the second or third one in there and, and getting a cold bath. So uh, these are, we're tying two 50-gallon hot water heaters together, and uh, uh, they're a quick recovery. And, and uh, when I picked these up, the guy said that uh, it'll probably cost you about half with these is what it's cost you uh, for the old ones because of the upgrades. It's just... Uh, privilege to be able to serve the Lord in, in this fashion. Uh, when Dick asked me about 20 years ago when Harold Shipley was having some health problems, he said, would you do this for a year? Well, that's turned into, what, 18 years now. And uh, so, but I said, well, as long as the Lord continues to give us good health, 
And uh, it's been a blessing. We have a lot of young people come back over the years. Uh, just an example, again, of what happens at camp, not just seeing young people going out, but uh, Marla Evans and Luke Hutton met at camp. Well, they're getting married here in a couple of months. So, it, it, you know, that's a good place for me to make. Parents, we don't recommend that, but we're just saying that does happen. <laughs> what I'd like to share now is when you hear about the projects, and you know that it takes quite a bit just to run the camp during the summer, the things that maybe as board members we know about is that our um, price that the, our kids pay is pretty much for um, food, transportation, um, the programming that we have. So we are still, in the state of Idaho anyway, we are still the lowest price for a week of camp. And so we know that it's hard to reach that for some of the kids, but when we have the Paul Baptist Church in, uh, in Paul is saying, where we've taken our kids, it's three and four hundred dollars for five days. And so we're very grateful to, to you to help with that. But you know what? That's how we're able to do things that aren't just get keeping the camp running, but upgrades and repairs is because of your donations. Last year's donations of the three um, fundraisers we had helped with these upgrades or these replacements. We had a dump trailer that we can use for our wood and our garbage hauling. Um, we were able to replace all the bathhouse faucets with, and new water lines. Uh, paint for the chapel was from these donations. The paint to begin painting, uh, repainting all of the cabins, the outside. A new KitchenAid mixer and the kitchen faucet. A replacement washer and dryer and the propane line run to, to those machines. See, we have had two and three main, uh, main rental camps. Those will keep up with the electricity, the propane, the septic being um, cleaned out, the forest service fees, insurance, and some maintenance. But what really makes a difference is the donations that you and other churches make. One, just to share with you, is that the church in Paul, who has had children coming, used to, about 20 years ago, there was a group, and then they stopped, and now we have quite a few coming from Paul Baptist. That is about 400 miles. And they have taken on camp as a mission of their church. They have called to see how many people can come for work camp. They had a fundraiser and raised um, close to $2,000 for us. So sometimes our churches in our group here, our eight, eight and nine churches, um, are not helping because they are involved with other camps or choose, choose that direction. So I want you to know, First Baptist, that you are our main supporters. But it's wonderful to have some new ones coming on. So this Saturday night at 6 o'clock, is a donation meal and um, silent auction for themed baskets. Uh, this will be a wonderful blessing to have you there and have you help us again. And I just thank God for pro providing this camp and for giving Jack and I an opportunity to serve. Thank you. Our uh, verse of the month this month is from Psalm 118, verse 24. We'll say the reference, and uh, then the verse, and then the reference at the end. And uh, here it is. Let's say it together. Psalm 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 24. Before we pray this morning, a prayer request that's not in uh, the bulletin or on the prayer sheet this morning from the Wagner family. 
Dave's son, Jerry, uh, Jerry's family was involved in a violent car accident uh, over the weekend, and there are three children still hospitalized at St. Luke's in, in Boise downtown. 17-year-old Harrison, 12-year-old Megan, who appears to be the most seriously hurt, and six-year-old Nathan, and, uh, or Nolan, sorry. And so would you please uh, remember to pray for this family and uh, the uh, recovery from this accident. Also, I want to say thank you um, on behalf of the Benford family for your many expressions of kindness and love, your cards, your prayers, support uh, following mom's, mom's homegoing and the service last Thursday. We just appreciate so much your care and your love that was expressed to us. Let's come before the Lord together in prayer as the ushers come to receive our offering this morning. It's my joy of thanking you also for your faithful giving to the Lord's work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that every good and perfect gift is from above, which comes down from you, from whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. Thank you, Father, that the perfect gift that's from you is salvation in Christ alone. And our faith is fixed in him as our Lord and Savior. Thank you for every other gift that we enjoy, the gift of relationships, the gift of love of one another, the gift of opportunities to serve, and the beautiful place here where we're able to live and raise our families. We also thank you for the gift of eternal hope in Christ alone. And we rejoice in that this morning. Lord, it's our privilege now to intercede on behalf of others. We pray for the Wagner family this morning, particularly these three children who are hospitalized this morning for Harrison and Megan and Nolan. Father, please touch their lives with your loving care. We also pray for Diane this morning and her illness. Lord, she's in your hands. You love her more than we do. And uh, we, we just commend her to your loving care. And we pray for others who are recovering from injury or illness or surgery this morning. Thank you for other churches in our community that are holding forth the light of the gospel. For Canyon Hill Nazarene Church here in Caldwell and Treasure Valley Baptist in Ontario. Lord, may these churches be faithful in continuing as lighthouses of truth. We also thank you for Carol and for Mike and Thera, their ministry with Wycliffe. Encourage them as they faithfully serve you. As we give, Lord, it's a joy and a privilege for us to be involved in your kingdom ministry in this way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. Would you please take the tablets, the little pads on the outside of each of the pews, Sign in. We'd like to know you're here. Pass it toward the middle. We want to extend a special welcome to first-time guests. We have a long tradition at First Baptist Church of mugging all of our first-time guests. <clears throat> so please, if you're visiting today, um, sign in at the Welcome Center in the foyer, and we would like to present you with a gift. We have a week-long Vacation Bible School, pre-K through sixth grade, to be held June 17 to the 21st. And we need volunteers to help, providing snacks, to donate craft items, and so forth. So if you are interested in assisting with that, please contact Angela Kim or Maria Ernest, or you can just write VBS on that registration slip that I just had you pass over. So now you know what that thing's for. Children's ministry needs your help. If you have a child, a grandchild, a niece, a nephew, even if you don't have any relatives at all, we would like you to assist or to consider assisting with the children's ministry. The um, nursery needs helpers uh, to serve once a month or to substitute. The children's church teachers serve one Sunday every eight weeks. Sunday school teachers serve one month rotations. 
Uh, the church will train you, so if you have no experience in children's ministry, don't be concerned. As long as you've never eaten a child, you're in like Flynn. I can say Flynn because today's St. Patrick's Day. Write children on that registration slip if you're interested in that, or you can contact Sarah Hill. Um, speaking of children, the Awana games were held yesterday and we want to extend a special thanks to john howard and arlene robinette they were our awana game directors um, sparks our sparks took third place and tnt boys and girls took first place thank you to all the kids who participated in the awana games that was a special note from debbie buxton all right, Easter choir practice is being held Tuesdays at 7 p.m. If you've missed them up till this point, don't worry about it, jump in now. This is an open invitation. You don't need uh, to have a special invitation. This is it. And if childcare is your reason for not coming, please know that childcare is being provided so that you can participate. Now there's been a lot said about Warm Lake Camp so far this morning, so I'll draw your attention back to the um, dinner and basket auction, which is Saturday at 6 o'clock, as Jack and Angeline have already mentioned. Um, you know what the donations are being used for. I won't go through all that again, but I do want to let you know that Carol Brenton will be doing the cooking, which seems apropos since she cooked at camp for so many years. Also, since... Uh, this touches on my favorite subject. I want to bring something up. I want to know, does anybody know what this is? Anybody? A sock. Oh, no, 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 no. You have that all wrong. This is a bank. This is the first national bank of fill in your name, okay? It has a cute little Scotty dog on it. It can be the first national bank of Scotty. This is what all of you can use to put away your money for family camp. I know you're getting tired of hearing me talk about family camp. Of all the people in the church today, I would like to see a show of hands of how many people have ever been to a family camp ever. Look at that. Look around you. See how many people have been to family camp? Now, I want you to hold your hands up. Get them up there. Now, keep your hands up if you were blessed by that experience. I didn't see any hands go down. I see some hands waving, awesome. All right, you can put your hands down now. I, I bring that up because I'd like you to consider family camp this year if you've been, if you've never been, if money is your reason for not coming, I wanna just remind you, family camp is only $15 per day per person, and that includes your lodging and three wonderful meals. This is your bank. You can start putting money in your bank. Every time you put $15 in your bank, you've paid for another day of camp for a member of your family. Now, if you're not planning, I know that camp isn't possible for everybody. Sometimes it's scheduling difficulties. Sometimes it's health challenges. It's just difficult to get around the camp because we don't have paved roads and pathways, sidewalks and so, so forth. So if that's your issue, I would like you to prayerfully consider that you might put some money away to sponsor another individual or family who can't make it to camp. So would you please take that to the Lord in prayer and see if that's something that he has called you to do. I know some of you have been blessed with the spiritual gift of giving, and this might be an opportunity for you to exercise that. And don't forget, just because it's called family camp doesn't mean you can't come if you're not married or don't have kids. Family camp is open to everybody, and we have a wonderful time. So. I'll stop hitting on family camp for one more Sunday. Uh, let's see, our church is invited to a community Good Friday service on March 29th at seven o'clock at Canyon Hill Nazarene. Uh, church members are needed for that. So if you would like to sing in the Good Friday choir, please write that on your registration slip. Okay, children, no, I'm not dismissing children. I am going to call Ed up here because he has something special he wants to talk to you about. And it's right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Hello there. 
Um, isn't it wonderful the number of things that this church has a chance to participate in? From uh, the family camp that we just talked about, the family camp uh, function dinners, just all of the different projects and all the different um, just uh, areas that we can fellowship. Uh, there's another area of fellowship in your bulletin. I'm going to read this part because then I won't duplicate what I was going to say. Celebrate Passover with a Seder service next Sunday. It's at 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Child care will be provided for the children up to kindergarten age. Please RSVP by writing in your, on your, your uh, attendance slip that you'll be there. Um, and if you can or you would like to, this is a little bit like a Baptist potluck. Um, there are some dishes that are traditional Jewish dishes that are available at the information counter back here. So if you're going to be there, pick up one of those. I know Johnny and Tita aren't here today. I know he'll be here next week. There's food involved. And I saw Tita's name on the, one of the signups. So if you want to eat some of Tita's great cooking, there you go. This is, this is really a wonderful celebration. From, from a Christian standpoint, it's, it's a chance for us to fellowship and to once again focus on Christ and, and really what he means. From a biblical perspective, it's a little bit different take than what we've seen before. This, this holiday is a very, very important holiday. And as I was talking with Pastor, just like Christmas and just like Easter, you wouldn't skip one of those because you did it last year. Well. This year, we're having Passover again. It shows up every year, right around the middle of, well, just right near Easter. Passover was so important in the Old Testament that God took the first of the year, which was in the fall, and he reordained the beginning of the religious year to begin with Passover in the spring on the 14th of Nisan. And then he started his religious calendar of seven major biblical events, holidays and feasts and offerings that cycled three in the spring, one in the middle of the year, and three in the fall. And every one of those holidays point very, very specifically right toward Jesus. And so if you would like to come and just be blessed from a very Christian perspective with a very, very Old Testament um, holiday, please come. It's next Sunday night. It's at six o'clock. We just need you to sign up, and it really is a blessing. And like I said, just because you did Christmas last year, you, you have to do Christmas this year again. Well, Passover is, is fun. It's, it's a little bit like dinner theater. It's about an hour and a half to two hours long, and it will be a real blessing. Now, the last thing on here is children. Children age four to second grade are dismissed.
Well, I'm going to ask you to stand up for just a moment. Would you do that, please? It's that time of the year when people start working outside on Saturday, Friday, and Friday afternoon, Saturday, and uh, you come into this warm room on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Might be just a little challenging to stay focused, so stand up, get the blood flowing again. You may be seated. I want you to stay with me, all right? Although the holiday that bears his name has become associated with legend and myth and excessive alcohol consumption and wearing green, St. Patrick, uh, that we acknowledge today, the man lived such a life that warrants reviewing and a commendation from Christians. The man behind the myth exemplifies a Christian life of sacrifice. Reliance upon God, a love and compassion for people and their eternal destiny, and an unfaltering hope in eternal life in Jesus Christ. Patrick's story is indeed inspiring and astonishing. We remember him today because it was on this day that he died in the 5th century. He was actually born in Britain in the late 4th century to an aristocratic family, Irish marauders kidnapped him from his home when he was 15 and took him as a slave to Ireland. He labored endlessly for six years, herding sheep and goats before a dramatic, dramatic escape and return to his family in Britain. His family was so thrilled to see him again, they never wanted him to leave. His atheistic beliefs before his kidnap, turned to the beliefs of a devout Christian in the context of his time as a slave. And he burned with love for Christ. After several years of religious study, he willingly journeyed back to Ireland on a mission to share the gospel message of salvation with a very pagan people in lifestyle that included even human sacrifice and barbarism, and paganism. His passion to pave the way for the gospel actually mirrors the lifestyle of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is our focus in this series of messages in his life and ministry as we continue today in Matthew chapter 3. This morning we're going to look at two specific days in the ministry of John. That is, the day that he baptized the Lord Jesus and then the day that immediately followed. So come with me to Matthew chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 13. Then came Jesus from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Well, the text opens with the information that Jesus left Nazareth and made the journey down to Judea from Galilee with the specific purpose of being baptized by John. And he... Um, is met by John's protest. But Jesus prevails because, he argued, of what his baptism would accomplish. These are interesting words, that his baptism would be fulfilling for all righteousness. Was Christ completely righteous as he stood before John asking to be baptized? Yes. 
Jesus was the fulfillment in his person of all righteousness without having to be made righteous. He was righteous. The only person who ever lived on this earth that was already righteous. So what's he talking about? In that phrase, fulfilling all righteousness, Jesus speaks of completing the model of everything that forms part of a relationship of obedience to God. Jesus is going to display for everyone what that looks like. And and at the same time, he validates the ministry that John had as ordained of God. And his message is one to be heeded. But the baptism itself, I want us to think this through, the baptism itself also validated the person of Jesus and his ministry. Here is the paramount expression of God's righteousness in his self-abasement in order to affect our salvation. Jesus left his glory in heaven. He was co-authoritative with the Father, and he had all the glory of eternal deity in his person. He was one with the Father and one with the Spirit. All the angelic beings worshipped him, and he, as it were, took off that glory as he would take off a garment and set it aside and took on humanity, took on human flesh. This so impressed the Apostle Paul that in Philippians pastor two, uh, chapter 2, he used these, these words, we also ought to be like Jesus in that regard, have that mind that he had, that willingness to be submissive and humble, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to hang on to or to be grasped, but literally emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, it's not that he disengaged himself from the righteousness of his father, which is spelled out in the Old Testament in Isaiah 45, for example. Verse 21, the second part of that verse, there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a savior. There is none beside me. Jesus did not disengage himself from that aspect. And Isaiah 46, 13, I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off and my salvation will not delay. I will put my salvation in Zion for Israel, my my glory. Jesus is identifying with God as Savior when he submits to baptism. In, In doing so, he identifies with sinners. Sinners had been coming to John for baptism. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, and Jesus identifies with the people who were coming. In what way? Well, submissive and humble. Secondly, his baptism pictured the Savior's coming death and resurrection. Baptism is such a beautiful picture. And we're familiar with this because his baptism also prefigures Christian baptism. And what is that? Well, when a person goes down in the water, it's an illustration, it's a reminder of being buried with Christ in the waters of baptism. A person is fully submerged in the water. And then they are brought up out of the water signifying and reminding us again of the resurrection of Christ. And when Jesus submitted to that baptism, he was pointing ahead to his death and his resurrection. His baptism also publicly affirms his messianic identity. God had given John the Baptist some specific prophecies regarding the coming of the one who would be Messiah, 
And Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. John understood immediately when Jesus came and when the Spirit descended, John understood that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He knew him from his human experience, but he did not know him as Messiah until this time. All the persons of the Godhead are revealed in this baptism. The Holy Spirit descends and rests upon Christ as a dove. Not, as, not specifically that a dove appeared, but if you picture a dove fluttering down, uh, the, the, the actual presence of the Holy Spirit, some kind of a visible manifestation of the Spirit's descent upon Jesus in a way that was dove-like, representing peace and gentleness, and yet superintending over creation. The Holy Spirit specifically came and ministered to Christ in this way. God the Father verbally reveals his son's identity and his own personal pleasure with his son. And these statements that are drawn specifically from Psalm chapter 2 and Isaiah 41, the divine son and the suffering servant. This expression of affirmation was repeated on the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples, Peter, James, and John, who were there, heard the voice and it made a, an incredible impression on John at the time and Peter and James. Peter wrote in his epistle in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, look, we didn't follow cleverly, devise myths and fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this, this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Now this refers to the Mount of Transfiguration and that event, but the voice was the same. The affirmation was the same. The Father was present. And Christ begins his ministry. So as baptism pictures his coming death and resurrection, it prefigures Christian baptism. It publicly affirmed his messianic identity. All persons of the Godhead are revealed here. And his baptism provided the context for fulfilling the promises that God had made to John the Baptist. In John chapter 1, verse 33, John said, I myself did not know him in the messianic sense, but he who sent me to baptize with water, that is God the Father, said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, now think with me about this. In summary, the event of Christ's baptism by John, Jesus said it was to fulfill all righteousness. In that sense, the baptism itself and Jesus' participation in it proclaimed his incarnation. That is, that this was not a mere man, but God who had taken on human form. God who had been born as a man. He was incarnate, God incarnate in flesh. It proclaimed his redeeming work. It was Peter also who said, we're not redeemed with perishable things, but with the precious blood of Christ, pointing to the redeeming work, the buying back work that Jesus would do in his death on the cross for us, buying us back out of our condemnation. It also announced his atoning work. That is that Jesus in his death would make atonement for our sin on our behalf, that the penalty required for our salvation would be paid in his death. And the baptism that he went through pictured and reminded us about that. It also reflect his, reflected his identity with sinners and his substitutionary death on their behalf. That is that Jesus took my place when he died. It, it reminded us of the fulfillment of prophecy. It pointed to his eternal deity and his identity in the Trinity. In all of these ways, the baptism of Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. 
I, uh, I didn't think that through until this past week. And as I thought it through, it blessed me greatly. I hope it also blesses you just to think about the wonderful figurings that are involved in that baptism. Well, the next day, Jesus and John met again. Come with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, where John writes of John the Baptist's ministry here in chapter 1. Verses 29 through 31, we'll start there. The next day, he, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. So John, having baptized Jesus the day before, publicly proclaims Jesus as the sin bearer, fulfilling the prophetic portrayals of the Old Testament. First, in the lamb that God provided in the place of Isaac. In Genesis 22, you remember the story. God commanded Isaac to take his son and sacrifice him to himself. And Abraham, in obedience, went. And just at the moment when he would have slain his son, he was restrained and told to stop. And there in the thicket was a ram caught, provided to, as a substitute for Isaac. And Jesus is introduced as the lamb that God provides, fulfilling that portrayal. And secondly, he is the lamb of the Passover that we're going to celebrate next Sunday night. Spelled out all the details in Exodus chapter 12, where that first Passover celebration is explained, how a lamb is to be taken, a perfect lamb, taken from the flock 14 days in advance, and cared for and known by the family, and then slain on Passover night, and to be eaten as part of the Passover celebration, the Passover picturing the death angel passing over the household where the blood of the lamb is applied, and Jesus fulfills that prophetic picture. There's the prophetic picture of the sacrificial lamb of Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before it shearers silent, so he opened not his mouth. He is the lamb pictured in the morning and evening daily sacrifices that are commanded in Exodus 29. He is the sacrifice of the lamb on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, in Leviticus 23, 27. Now on the 10th day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. The Day of Atonement is the most solemn and important holy day of the Jewish calendar. In the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement was the day the high priest made an atoning sacrifice for his own sins and the sins of the people. He went, as he did only one time a year, into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, and presented that blood sacrifice. And then the other goat was released into the wilderness to symbolically carry away the sins of the people. Yom Kippur was the only time during the year when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies. The 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are the days of repentance when Jews express remorse for their sins. Jesus fulfills that beautiful picture of Lamb of God. All of that is contained in the significance of John's words. Look, look, there he is. That's the Lamb of God. He announced the eternal nature of Jesus. This is he who takes away the sin of the world. He confirms that he had not known Jesus as Messiah before the baptism and proclaims that the coming of Jesus fulfills his own life purpose. The fact that he came is the whole reason I was born. There he is right there, the Lamb of God. 
John also announces himself as eyewitness to the deity of Jesus. Look back here in the text, verse 32 of John chapter 1. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of of God. Having seen the Holy Spirit come on Jesus the day before, he testifies to that. And he bears witness that Jesus is the person of promise, confirming that Christ's work of baptizing with the Holy Spirit fulfills the promises of God, and he gave his personal witness that Jesus is God's Son. The Gospels are explicit about the deity of Jesus Christ. Liberal scholarship and scoffers would deny the person of Jesus as deity. But the, the Bible couldn't be more clear about this. And we even have eyewitnesses who bear testimony to us after all these years, reliable first-person account witnesses of the identity of Jesus. Jesus began his ministry with baptism. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus identified his role and purpose. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That describes the spiritual condition of every person before they put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. Having placed faith in Christ, Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize those who became followers of Jesus. On Easter Sunday morning, we're going to make the opportunity available for people who've not been baptized before to publicly proclaim their identity with Jesus in baptism. Baptism does not save you, but you have the privilege of saying publicly, count me in, I, I'm one of those who loves Jesus. I, I'm one of those who has given my life to Jesus. And as Jesus humbled himself and submitted to baptism, I'm, I'm doing that and publicly. I want everybody to know that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. If you're in the family of God and you've not been baptized, I urge you to take this step of obedience. Matthew Henry, known to us as the great commentator of a previous century, had a wonderful father who wrote words of baptismal commitment for his children that became their baptismal statement of identification in Christ. They're a little bit formal for us in our culture, but they are wonderful words. Every follower of Jesus Christ could embrace these words and appropriately as they approach baptism. Here they are. I take God to be my chief end and highest good. I take God the Son to be my Prince and my Savior. I take God the Holy Spirit to be my Sanctifier, Teacher, Guide, and Comforter. I take the Word of God to be my rule in all my actions and the people of God to be my people under all conditions. I do hereby dedicate and devote to the Lord all that I am, all that I have, and all that I can do. And I do this deliberately, freely, and forever. What a wonderful commitment of faith. We all come from varying traditions with various convictions. But let me say this. 
There is nothing in the New Testament or the Old that takes away the command of Christ that we ought to follow him in baptism. Jesus gave us a wonderful example. And if his baptism fulfilled all righteousness, think of the blessing that would come to you as you come into the waters of baptism on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday. So the opportunity is there for you. I commend it to you and urge you to follow Jesus in that way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the humility of Christ. How remarkable that he would submit himself to this ritual when all others who came needed him as Savior and Messiah. Thank you for the privilege of being able to identify with him in baptism. Not a baptism that saves us, but a baptism that we engage as a step of obedience in following Jesus. It's in his holy and blessed name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us, please?
Oh, we're going we're gonna to covet your prayers this next week. Um, we're heading to lovely Roach, Missouri um, this next weekend. Uh, we're heading with a group of teens and college students and uh, some very brave helpers with Kim and Lori Heiger. Um, and we're driving uh, all the way over there. And uh, we get to work with New Tribes Missions and their Flashpoint Adventures. Um, they are going to teach our teens what they teach their missionaries about how to live in a tribal setting and share the gospel in a tribal setting in Papua New Guinea. And so it's going to be a great adventure. Um, hopefully we don't uh, come back with too much poison oak and poison ivy. Um, anyway, be praying for us. It's a long drive, but it's a wonderful opportunity for us to fellowship together and just um, hang out with New Tribes Missions and uh, actual um, individuals from Papua New Guinea that are coming to, to play the parts of villagers in lovely Roach, Missouri. So if you can just be praying for us, that'd be great. We'd greatly appreciate it. Let's finish with more love, more power. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>